Hello and welcome to Building the Premier Accounting Firm. I'm your host, Roger Connect, President of Universal Accounting Center. I'm excited to bring to you each and every week new episodes to help you actually run, operate, and sex and successfully have the Premier Accounting Firm in your area. It's the goal of each of these podcast episodes to share with you the tips and tricks that you can use to run your business, addressing the things that matter most, perhaps dealing with onboarding clients, things related to marketing, sales, mental health, and so much more. Each and every week, I bring on guests to help you actually focus on your business, and today's going to be no exception. I happen to have a great guest that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Familiar with. This is Ivan Meisner. Dr. Ivan Meisner is the founder and chief visionary officer for BNI, the world's largest business networking organization founded in 1985. The organization now has over 10,000 chapters throughout the world in every populated continent of the world. Imagine that. And each year, BNI generates millions of referrals, generating billions of dollars worth of business for its uh, new members. Now, among the many awards that's been awarded to Dr. Ivan Meisner, he's been identified as the father of modern networking from both Forbes and CNN. Dr. Meisner is actually considered to be one of the world's best leading experts in business networking and has been a keynote speaker for major corporations and associations throughout the world. He's been featured in the LA Times, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, as well as numerous other TV radio shows, including CNN, BBC, Today Show, NBC, and so many more. He's been named the Humanitarian of the Year by the Red Cross and has been the recipient of the John C. Maxwell Leadership Award. He is a proud uh, father and uh, husband to his late wife and uh, late wife Elizabeth, and is the co-founder of the BNI Charitable Foundation. Now, one of the things that I want to mention is he has visited all seven continents, having completed an Antarctic expedition in 2021. And his next big adventure is to be a future astronaut with Virgin Atlantic. So, Dr. Ivan Meisner, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Hey, Roger, thank you so much. And, and like uh, like I said earlier, call me Ivan, please. You bet. So first of all, as we begin our conversations, I, I think one of the things that's natural to bring up is obviously networking to talk about business, but I'd like to begin somewhere else. I'd really like to get into uh, basically back in the 1980s, just so what what was it that was going on? What was happening? And I know you had another profession that uh, caused you to actually build a mastermind group and start that. Um, what I'd like to do is actually begin there. And I think every business owner would just like to try and understand what it's like to build connections and get support. Um, what was it like back in the 80s before all this networking existed? Yeah, you know, I'd like to tell you I had this vision of an international organization with groups all over the world. But the truth is I needed some referrals for my consulting practice. And I put together some people I trusted. They trusted me. And we started referring business to each other. By the way, one of the very, very first people uh, was an accountant. Uh, she um, was a CPA and um, uh, had just left um, uh, the Beverly Hills Accounting Department, started her own accounting firm, and um, her firm is still a member today after 37 years. She She's one of the founding, Carolyn Denny is her name, she's one of the founding members of the founding chapter of BNI, and her son is the member now, 37 years later. Uh, and of course, of course, she's my CPA. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've worked with her now for 37 years. So I think that's a testament to the importance of relationship building with uh, accountants. And, you know, she's, she's kind of um, not the, the normal accountant in terms of you know, uh, what one might perceive as an accountant. She's probably the rainmaker because she's a really friendly, interactive, personable individual who is also good at the, you know, the accounting side. So anyway, I got sidetracked. Yeah, I, I was just looking for referrals for my consulting practice. And I put this group of people together and it snowballed. You know, I, 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 we ended up opening 20 groups in a year, and I just wanted one. But people kept asking me, hey, would you help me open a group? Would you help me open a group? And I kept saying, yeah, okay, fine, all right, all right. And we ended up with uh, 20 groups. So now I have over 10,800 in more than 70 countries around the world. 
You know, that is absolutely fascinating. Now that you've actually started to see this grow back in the 80s, I can't imagine you saw this becoming what it is today. So where do things go from here? Well, you know, in, in that first year, I did not see this coming. Um, like I said, I'd be fibbing to you to say that I th thought this would be an international organization. But I got it pretty quickly. Um, by, by December of 1985, I uh, recognized that this was going to be a um, much larger organization. And uh, I started doing calculations as to how large this organization could be. And this is back before Monsieur Google, where you could just get online and figure out, you know, what, what um, um, what's the population of different cities. Uh, I had to actually go to a library and, and <clears throat> do these calculations. And uh, it took me about six months, uh, but I, I figured that someday B and I could actually have possibly 10,000 chapters. And, uh, and here we are, uh, in 2020, we had 10,000 chapters. My Brody moment, now, do you remember, you remember the movie uh, Jaws? Yeah, of course. Okay, <clears throat> so Sheriff Brody, uh, towards the end of the movie, uh, was throwing out chum. And my, and my Brody moment came in December of 85, so about 11 and a half months after I started being I. Brody's thrown out this uh, chum into the water, and for the first time, he sees the shark, you know, come out. And he turns around and he walks over to the captain and he says, you're going to need a bigger boat. And that was my Brody moment, was like, yeah, okay, this is, <laughs> is going to be way bigger than I thought. Uh, I'm going to need a bigger boat. And, and how big was the question, and that's uh, why I did the research. Uh, BNI now has over, we have over 10,000 people who work for the company worldwide, who work for the company worldwide. Well, th that is awesome. Now, what I want to do is I want to go back to the 80s when you were realizing BNI could obviously grow bigger into the business, bigger than the business that you already had. So when did you actually make the tr transition to decide I'm going to go all in on this new BNI thing and not worry about the business that you actually were doing? Yeah, that was probably about 1989. Um, I I sold my consulting practice, which was honestly dwindling because I was spending so much time on BNI. That, but it, the crazy thing is, I was making I was making great money as a business consultant. I was making like a hundred bucks an hour. Oh my heavens! Now, and we're talking 1985, 86. I'm making a hundred dollars an hour in 85 or 86. And um, I, I decided, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to do this BNI thing. So I actually took a pretty big cut in pay. But I was willing to do it because um, it, it was just making such a big difference in people's lives um, that I, I, by 1989, four years into the BNI program, I sold my consulting practice and, and did BNI full time. That's incredible because I think a lot of people that are even in the accounting space see the same thing happening. A lot of the people that I work with coincidentally have a day job and they'll do accounting on the side. So they've got their employment that they're doing, you know, uh, during the day, but then weeknights, weekends, they're actually working with clients. And in general, they often start to see that their companies, that, that, that there's a pivot moment where they can actually all of a sudden recognize, well, maybe I need to do this instead. And they take the full-time job where where they're making their money, doing what they're doing. They're like, I, I need to actually focus on what I'm doing in accounting. And they jump basically both feet in, into that experience. And I see a lot, a lot of the listeners actually relating to that. I did that twice because I, I pivoted from, you know, I was a management consultant part-time for several years and then pivoted to full-time. And then, you know, I did the pivot to full-time and then a few years later sold that business and, and then pivoted to BNI full-time. Uh, so it's, it's an effective technique if you are good at managing your time. If not, it's a distraction and a disaster. Gotcha. You know, related to all this, obviously, networking is such a thing that you're an expert in. But for accounting professionals, it's not typically the thing that naturally comes to the forefront of their skill sets. It's actually the numbers that generally they have the confidence with. And they're pretty much uh, comfortable with the technical nature of things. 
But networking, however, is the backbone upon which they're able to build their business. And BNI, especially in our company, has been a central part, an integral part of the success we've had. So the question I wanted to ask is when you speak with someone and they say, but I'm not a networker, I don't have, I'm not comfortable with, I, it doesn't come natural to me. What is your response to them? So, you know, I, I've often heard people say, well, I'm an introvert. It's difficult to network. And um, I get that. Now, about 20 years ago, uh, my late wife and I were having dinner at um, I, I used to live in this is my home office in Austin, Texas. Uh, I used to live in uh, Southern California. And my uh, late wife and I were having dinner one night and uh, our kids were at some event preparing for some drama event and um it was it was just us and it was really nice and, and i'm talking to her and i say well you know me honey i'm such a an extrovert and she's like um no you're not i'm like what 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 do you mean i'm not of course i am she's like no you're a total introvert i'm like i am what how could you possibly say i run the world's largest networking organization i am not an introvert and she's like, hey, okay, whatever, <laughs> whatever you say, honey. I'm like, no, 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 whatever I say, how could you think that? And so she's telling me why she thinks I'm an introvert. And I'm going, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit like that and a little bit like that. And, and finally she gets to this one thing where introverts, she said, look, I'm reading a book right now called The, in, the Introvert and Extrovert in Love. I'm, I'm going to answer your question, I promise. She said, The Introvert and the Extrovert in Love. And, uh, and she was a total... My late wife was a total extrovert. I mean, total extrovert. So she said, introverts, according to the book, recharge their batteries by being alone. They, would just, they want to be alone. They don't want to be around people. You know, family maybe, but that's it. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's totally me. But I, I am not, I am not an introvert. I, I'm, I'm a keynote speaker. I'm not an introvert. So she's like, yeah, whatever you say. So now I'm mad, and I go into my office at home, and I get on the internet, and I find a test, and I take this test, and about introvert extrovert, and it says, congratulations, Ivan Meisner, you are an introvert who is a situational extrovert. Which means that when, when you are talking about a subject that you feel really confident about, you come across as an extrovert. Otherwise, you're a total introvert. Now go apologize to your wife. Okay, didn't say that last part, but I did. I, I did apologize to her. Now, this is important because it was an epiphany for me. An epiphany for me. I take this test. I'm an introvert who's a situational extrovert. And I started thinking about the kind of organization I created. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, oh my goodness, this is an organization for introverts. Because it's, it's an organization where you get to know one another. You meet every week. It's smaller groups of people, not hundreds, but dozens of people. You're meeting them weekly. You're building a relationship. It's all about the connection. I'm like, oh my God, how did I not see this? This is so obvious to me. And so the answer to your question is that Particularly, there are networks. Not all networks are like this, obviously. Some are really aimed at extroverts, but there are networks that are aimed at intro introverts. And BNI is aimed at introverts. It works for ext extroverts, but it it's also works really well for introverts because it's all about building relationships. So you see, both introverts and extroverts can be good at networking. The thing with introverts is they got to learn to make a connection with people. And the beauty of a group like BNI is that you're meeting every week. You, you make a connection. That's what I feel comfortable with. The, the extrovert wants to talk about themselves. That's their favorite subject. The introvert, they want to, they, they're willing to listen. Introverts are good at listening. Extroverts are good at talking. What I learned, though, is that um, networking is, uh, you know, a good networker has two ears and one mouth and uses them both proportionally. So an, an introvert is better at listening than an extrovert is. Extroverts have to learn how to shut up and listen. Introverts have to learn how to introduce themselves, how to connect with people, that first contact. Once they make that first contact, they're okay. And so, um, it, it, you know, I kind of stumbled into this, but I stumbled into it thinking I was an extrovert, but I created an organization that was really very conducive to introverts. 
you know, hearing you explain that, I can actually share an epiphany that I've had with BNI. It's the fact that I'm naturally an introvert and being an introvert, it's kind of hard to go to a networking meeting and actually interact with, find people to talk to and greet them. But one of the things that came natural is asking a lot of questions, just getting comfortable with going into the room and not worry about who I am and what I'm doing and trying to explain myself, but rather just asking great questions. And in that process, I found that people were comfortable to talk about themselves. When it comes to the 30 second commercial, that's perhaps not where I shine, but where I am really effective is in the one-to-ones, meeting with people off, off to the side, talking to them individually. And it's in that process that I can dive deeper into who they are, what they do, and naturally, they're just going to respond by uh, reciprocating. They just want to ask me about what it is I do. And I really don't feel the pressure, the pressure to manage the room being a, an introvert like that. But one of the things that I can say is I can go to a meeting and not be in the center of attention. I can actually uh, get, get things done. I can pull individuals off to the side, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them, and just get them to open up and talk about themselves. Right. And that's where I do very, very well. No, I get it. And, you know, uh, particularly in groups like B&I where uh, you, you have a chance to introduce yourself every week, but there's one or two people that go in a little deeper and they do a, a longer presentation, five, 10 minutes, 12 minute presentation. Uh, I, I, I got a great story about an accountant, a CPA at a B&I group. One of my original chapters, I mean, we're going back 36 years ago, uh, really good accountant, well uh, respected in the group. And it was really funny because um, I was the, the, one of the leadership team people came to me and said, we got to talk to this person because they're ready to quit. And it's, it wasn't my CPA from the first chapter. It was another one. And so I sat down with her and, and I said, what's going on? She said, well, um, I'm scheduled to do, do the um, feature presentation, which is 10 minutes long, uh, in, in five weeks. And if I have to do it, I quit. <laughs> I'm like... You quit? <laughs> Why would you quit? She said, because I, I am not going to stand up in front of 30 people and talk for 10 minutes. I'm just, I'm not going to do it. And so if you're going to make me do it, I quit. I'm like, okay, well, first of all, don't quit. Let's talk this through. <laughs> you know, we're not, we're not going to make you do something you don't want to do. And so we're talking and she was just totally introvert, did not want to speak in front of a large group. And so true, this is an absolute true story. I said to her, Okay, so let's just operate on the basis of you're not going to do a speech. She said, okay, what then? I said, would you be willing to give a test? And she said, what do you mean? Now, this is, you know, mid-80s, and there had just been some, um, a lot of uh, uh, changes in the IRS regulations in the mid-80s. And I said, well, there are a number of changes in the IRS regulations just recently. Would you just be willing to, no speech. You do not speak other than read questions. Just read 10 questions that you make up and just say true or false. Is this true? Is this false? And then read the question and have them vote. How many say true? How many say false? And then just give the answer. That's it. You don't have to do anything more than that. And, and she said, well, yeah, I, I could do that. I said, well, and she, but she said, why? That's not a presentation. I said, well, it's to show how much you know about tax law. So they're impressed with your knowledge. And she's like, okay, I can do that. All right, Roger, this is so great. <laughs> she gets up. She's in about like question four or five. Now, you know, they're, you know, half the people are saying true, half are saying false. The half that are saying false are like, oh my God, I'm going to go to jail. <laughs> this is going to be horrible. And she's like, okay, well, let me explain it. Now she's talking extemporaneously. She, cause she's, she's focused on her on her topic, on her, on her wheelhouse, which she knows so well. They, she actually ran over time. <laughs> they, they had to pull her off stage because she ran over time. And so my point here is that there are techniques that anyone can use. Even if you're nervous about talking to people, there are techniques that you can use to make it a lot easier for you, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, um, to, to really be a rock star when you're networking. And that's the key is for people to really feel confident in your ability to, to provide a good product or service. You know, you're sharing the story regarding the spotlight 
the feature presentation, I think that's hugely helpful to people because you're right. It doesn't have to be some formal presentation that someone gets up, presents with a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, it can be something a lot more natural and engaging. For example, in our chapter, we happen to have a lot of people that recently started using a service called Kahoot. And what they were doing is basically a group quiz where they got everyone engaged. And it's uh, obviously a less formal format. It's just asking questions that the group can actually say yes or no. And in doing so, we get to all participate and have fun with it. But uh, it allows us to get a lot, a lot more comfortable in the environment than just to speak and to uh, obviously present some, some presentation that's uh, kind of stiff and uh, too formal. Now, from an accounting point of view, th this is something I wanted to go to next. You're in a position where in your organization, being the CFO visionary officer, uh, you you uh, basically set forth to really kind of see what you might be able to do as an opportunity to give back. And in going to give back, you and your wife were able to actually designate a charitable organization to give back. And I was kind of wondering, at what point did your business get where get to where you were all the, all of a sudden uh, able to feel that you could make an impact and do something positive? When did you actually look at that from the business side? Oh, so I've always um, contributed personally. I think that a successful business person has um, an obligation. I mean, I don't like to tell people what they should do. I feel that if I'm a successful business person, I have an obligation to put back into the community from which I draw. So even at the point at which I was, you know, an employee with other companies, I, um, I was a big brother as, as a young man in my 20s. Uh, and then, you know, became involved in a local service club, a rotary club, where I gave back to the community. Uh, then uh, was uh, on the board for a uh, boys and girls home uh, in Southern California, uh, boys and girls club. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I had been contributing for some time. It finally got to the point in 1998, it was about, you know, 13 years into BNI, where I could actually contribute more than just, you know, a thousand dollar donation. I could do a much more sizable donation um, around the late 90s. And what I did is something that was recommended to me by a business associate. He said, you know, I said, look, I don't have millions to start a foundation. Um, but uh, but I, I, I have, you know, thousands or tens of thousands that I can do um, in a contribution, but I don't want to do it all at once at one time because I don't know what next year will be like. And and he he recommended community foundations to me. Are you familiar with community foundations, Roger? Yeah. So most people aren't there. A community foundation is a really big foundation that has a series of donor advised funds and you can create your own fund underneath a parent foundation. And I uh, set up my first community foundation. I set up my first foundation fund under the California Community Foundation, which was the largest in the United States. And um, it, it's, a, it's a great, it was a great organization. I later moved that uh, fund to um, the Carolina, North Carolina Community Foundation because BNI moved to North Carolina. And at that point, BNI created its own 501c3 nonprofit foundation. But it took me, you know, 15, 20 years to create my own nonprofit foundation. So up to that, I used a community foundation, which I highly recommend that if, if you want, you know, to look, feel, and smell like your own foundation, create a fund underneath a 501c3. There are restrictions. For example, you can't pay Uncle Harry to do work for the foundation. It, all Any money you spend has to go to another 501c3. That's one of the regulations of a, of a donor-advised fund. So 1998 is when we created the Donor Advice Fund. Since then, BNI has given away millions, millions of dollars in charitable contributions to organizations all over the world, mostly focused on children and education. That's been our focus. Yeah, I really love the emphasis that you had. Uh, you can't go wrong with education. Yeah, we, we, we had that decision made through our board of advisors. You know, we, they were, you know, when we decided to do charitable work as an organization more in a more formal way, you know, everybody and their mother <clears throat> wanted different things. They wanted, <clears throat> you know, AIDS research, um, um, a a animal rights. Uh, I mean, it was just all kinds of different things. 
And as we were talking about some of these things, people would get really mad. <laughs> They'd get really upset that we're thinking about doing one versus another. And what we discovered was nobody gets mad at children in education. It's like, well, that's not what I focus on, but okay, I can, <laughs> you know, you're helping kids. That's good. That's fine. So, um, and that was all, already something in my DNA because I had been a big brother and uh, had worked with the, the um, Boys and Girls Club. So I... Um, yeah, that was a good move. That and so that is the focus of the BNI Foundation. You know, children represent twenty percent of today's population, but they are one hundred percent of tomorrow's future. And uh, and so we think that was a good choice. It was one that my my late wife and I um, supported greatly. Well, one of the great things that I'm grateful for is I have also had the opportunity to do a number of things in, uh, with the youth myself, like what you were describing earlier. And, and uh, in my career, I was involved with the Boy Scouts of America, and I did a lot with the, them, the young men in our community, and have fond memories of what they were able to do, and I with them, and at the same time, have seen them grow up and become uh, great young men. It's amazing the relationship that I have with them as well, because now that they're young adults, I, I, I see them. I experience, you know, I've been invited to their weddings. I've gotten to see them start their families. And in doing so, basically, the experience I've had is I've seen the character impact, the, the decisions that they're making because of the things that I was involved in as they were growing up. And I, I've kind of evolved to the point that it's kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You, you get to a point where all of a sudden you have this self-actualization where you can give back, you can make a difference. And I can see that it has made a difference and I love what I was able to do. So I wanted to now ask you uh, kind of a, another question and it, it's basically regarding your transition. It's when did you finally realize that it was time to step out of kind of the formal day-to-day -day operations of BNI as a leader? Uh, as accounting professionals, there are times in their companies where they're there's opportunities to work more with their clients and to do more with them than just do the accounting, perhaps stepping into kind of a CFO or advisory role uh, where they find themselves in situations where with their clients, they can have that same type of situation, basically getting out of the day-to-day -day operations of the business. Uh, what advice would you give them as they consider that evolution in their own business? Well, I've, I've got some important suggestions. First of all, uh, it's true. I no longer run the day-to-day -day operations of BNI. I'm now the Colonel Sanders of BNI. You know, I'm the, I'm, I'm the spokesperson for the organization. I get to do this for a living, which is a, a lot of fun and, and, and worthwhile. Along the way, I think it's important if you want to scale your business, and I'm actually working on a book right now, Roger, called Garage to Global. How do you take your business out of your garage? Because my business was literally in my garage and, and in the, an office above my garage. Um, and how do you take your business from being a garage, uh, you know, an enterprise out of your garage to a global enterprise? How do you scale it? And there are a number of times throughout your career where you have to learn how to delegate or relearn how to delegate effectively. And a lot of people, I certainly, you know, had work on my doctoral degree on, on things like delegating, but nobody ever taught what I'm going to share with you here. When you delegate, and if you want to scale, you must learn how to delegate effectively. You delegate not only responsibility, but you have to delegate authority. And that's the tough part. You delegate both responsibility and authority. We, we delegate responsibility to people that we don't give them the authority to make decisions. And they, they keep coming back to the, to the boss and saying, well, what do I do here? What do I do there? And that's when the boss goes, well, it would have just been easier to do this myself because I'm constantly managing this. Well, you can't. You've got to delegate both authority, uh, both responsibility and authority. Now, you don't delegate 100% authority to a learner. That's important. You de delegate some percentage of authority. So you hire somebody new in the role and you say, you have 50% authority. You can make, these are the decisions you can make. Now, in three or four months, I want you to be at here. And then I want you to be at here. And then I want you to be at here. I want you to, you know, and you might even still hold back 5%. You know, I would delegate 95% authority. Generally, the authority that I withheld was uh, uh, some financial authority. You know, once you hit this number, you got to come see me. 
You can't make the decision on this number. Or legal. You know, once somebody's talking about an attorney, you got to come see me. So those are usually the two things that I always hold back. And, and so now people are going to listen to this and they're going to go, yeah, that's all fine, except people, your employees will screw up. Yeah, they'll screw up. <laughs> you, you can take that to the bank. But hang on, did you never screw up? Of course you did. I did. I made so many mistakes, I don't know where to start. And so it's all part of the ability to be able to scale. If you really want to scale, you need four, five, 10, 20. I got 10,000 people doing the work of BNI today. And when I started, it was me and two part-timers. Two part-timers. Uh, so the amount of one employee, so it was me and one other full-time uh, spot when I started BNI. Now there's 10,000. You can't do that unless you learn how to delegate. Now, people will make mistakes. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, try, I'll try and tell you a quick story about someone who made a big mistake. It was like, it was a five or $10,000 mistake. It was big and it was years, it was decades ago. And man, I was upset. And now she had the authority to do it, but it was a mistake. And I called her into my office and she came in and she said, are you gonna fire me? I said, well, I got a couple questions for you. Um, first of all, describe what happened. She described what happened. I said, okay, did you learn anything from this? And she said, yeah, this is, this is what I learned. This is what I would do differently next time. Um, and I, I wouldn't do this. And I said, okay, all right. Well, the answer to your question is no, I'm not going to fire you. And she's like, thank you. Why? <laughs> Why aren't you gonna fire me? And I said, because I just invested $10,000 in your education. I believe based on your answers, you will never do that again. She said, oh gosh, no, I'll, I'll never do that again. It was obviously a mistake. I'm like, yeah, okay. So I just invested a lot of money in your education. You're not gonna do that again. Now, there was always a difference between an honest mistake and you know just um, carelessness, not paying attention. Well, I'd have fired her in a heartbeat if it was carelessness. But it wasn't carelessness. It was an honest error, mistake, bad decision. And so I said, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to fire you because I just invested a lot of money in you. And and I ended up with an employee who was, you know, uh, very loyal to the organization. So um, it, 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 it's going to happen. But look, I've made bigger mistakes than she did. <laughs> In my tenure, I made way bigger mistakes. So um, it happens. That's, the, that's one of the most important things to scale. Uh, delegate authority and responsibility. Responsibility and authority both. Okay? Okay. You know, you know, I love this explanation because it actually makes sense to me. And I love the story because it's similar to my experience. You know, your example of education, learning from those, those experiences is so true. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to share is that in our business, it happened to start back in 1979. I'm the third president of the company. And being the third president of the company, I had to go through this evolution, as you're describing, where the second president was retiring. And in that decision, there was the responsibility and authority to be given in time, uh, basically the, the two things that you mentioned. And the way it basically transitioned for me is when I first started, there were a few thresholds. Uh, first of all, uh, I couldn't spend over certain limits without his involvement. Uh, he was wanting to keep the reins on the financial side of business. There were also legal things that uh, he was obviously still legally bound to the company. He was a liable, a liable partner. So he was interested in keeping his signature. And uh, at that time, obviously I had to involve him in the legal things that were going on within the business. But there were also what we referred to as sacred cows, sacred cows, which is when I sat down with him, I basically asked, well, what are some of the things that I cannot change that I can't do anything about? And he listed out, there are these few things that you can't change, at least not for, for the time being. And they were basically things I had to work with, work around, had to be aware of. But in time, with some direction, I was given the ability to not just put my fingerprint uh, on something, but actually put, start putting my stamp on it, basically because I could run the business where he removed himself from the financial 
uh, side of things. I could make whatever financial decision I needed to. Legally, I was running the business, became the CEO for the company, obviously now carrying the legal responsibilities for the business. So the last thing were the sacred cows. And to this date, none of those remain simply because of the fact that the business was able to evolve and take the direction that I have had over now nearly uh, 10 years in running the business that it's now I'm at the helm. And believe me, this this happened quite quickly. I don't want to imply that it's only recently that all this has happened, but it does happen. Yeah, it's a great description. And, and that's all part of scaling a business effectively. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Uh, here, here's the next question, and perhaps it's going to be a little bit more personal in nature. So I'd really, really like to go as far as you'd like to go with it, how comfortable you may be. And I know that a lot of our listeners, being that they are accountants themselves, are also human beings. They have challenges. And we all have unexpected things that we have to deal with as humans, as individuals. And they're sometimes unfortunate. Life can be ugly at times. But at the same time, we're also working with so many of our clients going through these things can can sometimes as accountants be a, a challenge just because of the fact that we've got work, we've got life, we've got family. Uh, so there's a, a lot of things that we get exposed to that uh, really can be a, a hiccup in our lives. So I'm I'm curious, you've experienced these same types of things. You've spoken of your late wife and you've had some health issues. How do you manage the stresses associated with those unexpected, unfortunate events? Yeah, look, um, I think one of the things I've learned over the years is that your windshield is larger than your rear view mirror for a reason. Um, it's really important to continue to look forward. And, and, and it's not easy if you're going through it. You know, uh, the, probably one of the most devastating things that ever happened in my life was losing my my wife of 31 years. Um, that was, uh, you know, these ladies, they, they, they live longer than us guys. And she was eight years younger than me. And so it was just not, it wasn't part of my plan. It was just not what I expected. And so losing Elizabeth was, um, was devastating in my life. And, and I've had, you know, many other challenges throughout my career. I, I, um, I was diagnosed for, with cancer 10 years ago. I was told I had six months to get surgery. Um, and I managed through holistic means to kick the can down the road for 10 years. And just a couple of months ago, uh, went through radiation treatments. And so, um, you know, you, you get setbacks like this. Uh, I think the key is to um, recognize that the windshield's larger than the rearview mirror. You, you, you have a life that you have lived that you want to honor, uh, people in your life that you want to honor, um, situations in your life that you want to honor, and, and, you know, keep an eye on that rearview mirror. But you also have to move forward. And I think one of the ways that I've done that without um, too much stress, we all have stress. I have, look, look at all this gray hair I have. I earned this gray hair. So, you know, it, it doesn't come naturally. It, well, maybe it does. But look, my dad passed away. My dad passed away at 86 years old. So I was like in my uh, 50s. I was 56, 57. I was 58 when he passed away. My dad died at 86. He had less gray hair than I did at 56. So, um, you know, I, I've had a stressful life. One of the things that I've done throughout my life to try and maintain um, a calm or peace uh, is a, I, a mental health day. Every week, I try to have at least one day that's it's my mental health day. It's a way that I have a margin in my life where... Uh, I don't go anywhere. I don't do any work. I, you know, hang out in the swimming pool, maybe take the boat out for a ride. I, I relax. I'm at, you know, just do, oh, I watch TV. Okay. So I do watch TV. You know, people are like, oh my gosh, you watch TV. Yeah, I watch TV. I watch movies. I watch TV. It's a way of, um, of recharging my batteries. And so I think you, you have to find whatever yours is, whatever that might be for you. It might be reading a book. It might be, you know, I've, I've been really getting into audible books lately. I've been listening to audible books a lot. And so um, there's a lot of uh, things that you can do to recharge your batteries, but you have to do it. 
you know, I really thank you for that. You, I agree. You have to find what works for you to recharge your batteries. Introvert, expert, extrovert, uh, people, hobbies. We all got to find those things that we can do to basically recharge ourselves to be able to go back into whatever it is that we're dealing with on a daily, weekly basis with our clients. So completely agree. And I thank you for that. Um, now, I also understand that congratulations are in order. I know you recently announced that you're engaged. So how are things going? How are things changing for your life now that you're in that Twitter-pated stage? <laughs> I'm 66. I don't know if Twitter-pated is, uh, is relevant anymore, but, you know, because you have, you, have, you have enough experience that you kind of know what you're getting into. Um, you know, so my wife passed away two years ago, and uh, I have met a wonderful woman. Uh, it, was, it, it, was, it was a referral. It was li literally a referral. Somebody referred her to me. She works for Jack Canfield. Uh, her name is Jody. And she works for Jack Canfield, who wrote uh, the Chicken Soup for the Soul uh, series. And ironically, while we're talking, Jack just texted me on something. Um, so I've known Jack a long time, and, and it was a fantastic referral. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's a new direction in my life. And um, she's an amazing woman, and I'm looking forward to this uh, new direction. I'm happy for you. You know, th uh, this is great. Uh, I'm thankful to know that your health is well, getting better. And uh, I'm going to ask you one last question, trying to wrap this up. Uh, the last question I'm going to circle back to is obviously networking. Uh, one of the things that I think we we are seeing in the networking world is things are evolving and changing. I'd like to know your your thoughts about the future. How do you see networking as a physical, active, face-to-face -face event compared to maybe the online, the proverbial internet type connection? Uh, what are your thoughts as to how to maximize those? And uh, where do you see the future is going for us? So I actually, in 2018, wrote an article <clears throat> for entrepreneur.com. The, the, the title basically was The Future of Face-to-Face -face is Online. And I wrote that in 2018. Now, I didn't see COVID coming, but what I did see was um, technology. I mean, look at, look at the technology we have here, you know, where we can get on either Zoom or some platform to uh, do this interview from different parts of the country. Sometimes I do these from different parts of the world. Um, the technology is amazing today. And, um, you know, four years ago, uh, Linden Labs said that within the next 10 years, mixed reality technology, the metaverse, holographic imaging, is gonna be as commonplace as uh, an iPhone. And um, I realized that that's gonna really change the networking platform. And there's going to be a time, I mean, we kind of chuckle at this, but there's going to be a time like in Star Wars where you've got, you got a, a real Jedi Knight sitting there and a couple of holographic images and then a real Jedi Knight and they're having a meeting and we're going to have some variation of that in the not too distant future. By the way, Roger, when we get to that point, I want to be Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm just putting that out there. I want to be Obi-Wan. I think, I think what we're seeing right now and we're seeing it in BNI is a lot more hybrid uh, groups where they're meeting um, three times a month online and one in person. And we have many, 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 many groups who have gone back to in person. And there are still a number of groups that are only online. I mean, we had 600 chapters open during COVID. So we still have uh, hundreds of chapters who've never met in person. But we have tens of thousands who've gone back to meeting uh, in person or hybrid. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it certainly does. And I'd like to add that I think technology as a platform has gotten to become much more stable, more reliable, and it's allowed us to do business uh, more, you know, basically remotely, internationally, more comfortably. And I think that's phenomenal. A phone call, email, this is so much more, and it really does help to have those virtual uh, means of communication. And I also, also think that it allows business engagements to become more personable because we're able to actually see people that we're interacting and working with. Uh, and, and second, I do want to say I need to get an avatar. Like you just said, Obi-Wan, I need to come up with my go-to response and figure out what my avatar is. So that that is awesome. Now, okay, what I'd like to do is actually wrap this up and uh, share with uh, everyone what's going to happen. First of all, I'm going to do an offer and invite the listeners to actually go to the episode description and get that. But I'm going to come back to you for a closing thought and uh, basically see what you'd like to do to kind of wrap this up. 
but I'm going to, going to also do a summary. So first of all, for the offer, I do want to invite everyone to go to the episode description and check out the information there. You can find basically a BNI chapter near you. One of the things that I want you to do is go back to the episode description and take advantage of this opportunity to expand your own networking. Go out there, actually get involved with BNI and see what it can do for you. Uh, it's actually been a wonderful uh, move for us. Uh, the motto of giver's gain, I think, is a philosophy that's played very well for us as an organization. We've actually grown some of our divisions of our company on the backbone of networking, and we've done it basically through BNI. I'm also coincidentally a volunteer. I'm currently a director working with two different chapters. So I want to point that out, that BNI has been a very influential part in our business model, and I'm grateful for it. The second thing I want to do is invite you to check out the episode description for a link to some free resources that Ivan has put together for us, where you can actually go and get a number of free resources that uh, he's prepared and produced for us to take advantage of that are completely free. So go there to the episode description and take advantage of those. Likewise, subscribe to this podcast. If you haven't already done so, I would encourage you to do so because each and every week we come out with episodes that are with the experts to help you understand what it is you can do to work on your business. So subscribe to the podcast, set those notifications and go back to the previous episodes and find out what other things we've discussed with the experts that you can take advantage of, listen to, and most importantly, adapt in your business. I really uh, want to also express appreciation to Ivan. He's really shared a, a great perspective of starting something in business. Sometimes you have to pivot. And like he did, uh, we as accounting professionals oftentimes find ourselves as we're working on our businesses needing to pivot, change, and do something different. And I think he really illustrated that in his uh, explanation of his journey. He started with those groups with the intent of networking to grow his own company, and soon he was off, obviously, doing network as a business model. He also focused on two things that I think are really important. Uh, for example, starting the business with the intent of offering a specific service like us with accounting, bookkeeping, tax. But before you know it, you're doing a lot of advisory work and we may find opportunities to present themselves where we can actually transition and pivot for our clients. We need to really be open to those things, really entertain the opportunity to do something different than we were actually pl uh, planning on. The second thing that I really appreciated from this is our conversation about his giving back, finding a way to actually give back to the community and make a difference there. I, I really found his opportunity to participate in different organizations with the youth. Uh, he's now got his charitable organization with BNI that's something specific. It's helping them with education. That's amazing. And I uh, would invite everyone to check out more what they can do to contribute to that. That's something that I think our listeners can do more of as well. The third thing I wanted to point out is that he did speak of the windshield being larger than the rear view mirror. Each of us in our own lives obviously have hiccups, challenges, struggles, unforeseen events that we run into. And he just very, very clearly pointed out that what we need to do is be prepared to actually move forward from these uh, situations and better ourselves from them. And honestly, live life, continue to live life. He's clearly pointed out that you just get ready for that next new chapter that oftentimes can be very exciting and fun. And I'm grateful for him and his experiences that today in his own life have uh, kind of set that example. And the last thing I want to do is kind of end on this idea of networking. It's hugely important in any business. As much as we, want, we may want to say that accounting is a numbers business, it truly is a people's business. And what I mean by that is it especially means that we need to be open and willing to work with, engage with our clients, interact with them, so that if we can just at least be open to or open to these various forms of networking, such as technologies, uh, allowing us to do remote, remote conversations, like we're doing here today, I think this will just be a way to broaden our opportunities and make those connections, finding those potential clients and building our business. So obviously a lot of little nuggets here in the conversation today. So Ivan, what would you like to conclude with? Well, listen, I think if you want to be successful in business today, you got to do six things a thousand times, not a thousand things six times. And I think all too often business people are really focusing on doing a thousand things six times. And that just never works nearly as effectively. It's about consistency over and over and over again over time. And I think this is one of the things that accountants can be really great at is doing things over consistently. And um, that's the way to build a successful uh, accounting business in, in, in any business, in my, in my opinion. 
Excellent. Well, sir, thank you for your time today. It's been amazing. I've been looking forward to this conversation for some time now, and I appreciate it. Thank you so much for being on the show. As a conclusion, let me just mention to the listeners again, obviously subscribe. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to us as well at Universal Accounting Center. If you're looking to apply these principles, would like to understand more what you can do to actually grow your business, give us a phone call. You can reach us at 801 265 3777, or you can visit us at universalaccountingschool.com. And with that being said, always remember this, if it's about accounting, it is universal. Take care, be safe out there, everybody.